Huntington's disease is a disease that's a neurodegenerative disease that affects the dorsal striatum of our brain. It's named after physician George Huntington. And we have a gene on chromosome number four that produces the Huntington protein. And in most of us, it's normal, but one out of 10,000 people actually have a mutation in this Huntington gene that causes an abnormal Huntington protein that has several different functions, one of which is neuronal survival. And so that's what's pertinent to Huntington's disease. So at around age 40, if you have the Huntington's disease allele, it's autosomal dominant, so your offspring would have a 50% chance of also receiving it. It will cause this death preferentially in this area of our brain called the dorsal striatum. <clears throat> so just kind of give you some context. Here's our brain stem, the medulla pons and midbrain. And then right above that, we would have our our thalamus in here and our hypothalamus, but just kind of to the outside of that, we have some subcortical nuclei that are part of our basal ganglia. When you hear basal ganglia, think movement. Basal ganglia affects our movement when, when we want to move and when we don't, don't, want, don't want to move. <clears throat> so the dorsal striatum includes the caudate nucleus. We have the anterior, that's where it's most affected, and then the body and then the tail of the caudate nucleus, which is just a group of neuronal cell bodies that kind of wrap around. <clears throat> we also have the putamen, or putamen, which I've heard it pronounced both ways. And it also has these, what's called medium spiny neurons. And these, these spiny neurons in these areas are inhibitory. And so um, they release GABA. So they're GABAergic neurons. <clears throat> and so if these die out, you lose that inhibition. So with Huntington's disease, um, you have this protein. And at the end of the protein, it has a poly Q tail. So Q stands for glutamine. You have these nucleotide repeats. So it's CAG, CAG, CAG. And you may have up to like 35, if you're normal, of these CAG repeats that produce just a bunch of glutamines in a row. Remember, you have codons that code for the amino acids. <clears throat> so when someone has 36 to 39 of these CAG repeats, they're at risk for Huntington's. They could develop it. But if you have 40 or more, it's 100% penetrant, which means there's nothing that can stop this disease from taking place. A lot of times during spermatogenesis with someone who has Huntington's disease, it's called nucleotide expansion, where some of them are added, so you get even more CAGs. The more of these trinucleotides that you get, the worse the disease. So it can get worse and worse as it's passed down. So they can develop it younger and younger. Instead of being like 40 or 50, it may be even earlier than that. So that's kind of how this disease process works from a genetic standpoint. So let's go ahead and talk about what happens at the beginning of Huntington's disease. At the beginning, we have, we have this balance of movement in our basal ganglia. We have an excitatory pathway and we have an inhibitory pathway. And these are called the direct and indirect pathways. And um, I made videos of these, so I'll try to link them in the description. If you want to see them, they're complicated loops, but to simplify it and get the most out of this video, let's just simplify it. We have this excitatory and inhibitory pathways, and we want them in balance. When the balance gets off one way or the other, you have movement disorders one way or the other. If it's more excitatory, you have movements that you don't want. If it's more inhibitory, you can't move when you want to. So you want this balance, and normally we have this balance. So when someone has uh, Huntington's disease, at the beginning stages, the neurons that are affected most are the inhibitory neurons. So we have inhibitory neurons that are in their dorsal striatum, the caudate nucleus and putamen, and these die first. So if you don't have the inhibitory side and the excitatory side is getting unchecked, you're going to have more movement than you want. And this is what's called Huntington's chorea. Chorea is this movement that they, it's involuntary. It's where you have this writhing of your neck and then you have just like this dance-like movement of the limbs. And actually, Korea means dance-like or dance in Greek. So that's the symptoms you get early on. You also have some inhib inhibitory pathways that affect your behavior and your emotions. And these are going unchecked too. So you have these different mood issues. So the per personality of the person changes. And it's really sad because, you know, it, it's, for, it's, it's, it's for, the, for the worse and there's nothing they can do about it. It's not really them anymore. You know, they have this issue in their brain where they might be mean to their family members and stuff, and they can't help it. They don't have this inhibi inhibition. So there's some drugs that actually uh, 
are used to reduce these symptoms. They don't decrease the progression of the disease, but they actually reduce the symptoms of it. So let's talk about that a little bit. So dopamine plays a big role in this balance of excitatory versus inhibitory in our basal ganglia. And key nuclei in our basal ganglia are the putamen and the caudate nucleus, which are the dorsal striatum. And uh, just to give me, before we go that far, I want to tell you what the striatum is. If somebody just says striatum, they're including the dorsal striatum and the ventral striatum, which includes the nucleus accumbens. This group of nuclei is involved in our reward pathway, the mesolimbic system. We're not going to talk about that, but I wanted to include that for just comprehensive sake. But when we're talking about Huntington's disease, we're just talking about the dorsal striatum, this anterior caudate nucleus and putamen. So we have these um, medium spiny neurons in here and in here. And they have dendrites on them with spines that uh, receive signals of dopamine. The dopamine comes from the midbrain called the substantia nigra. And I have it abbreviated here, SN, for substantia nigra. So that's what this is. And you have projections from the substantia nigra that go to the putamen and to the anterior caudate nucleus. And basically what dopamine does is it desensitizes these neurons, these medium spiny neurons, to glutamate. So just to remind you, glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter. And so if we want our inhibitory neurons to fire and they're not, they're desensitized to glutamate, then they're not gonna fire. And so if we're having these neurons die, we only have a few remaining neurons. We wanna get the most out of inhibition out of those so that we don't get that chorea. And so if you can block dopamine somehow, you can decrease its desensitizing effect to uh, glutamate. So I know that's kind of complicated. So let's go through that again. We have these neurons, medium spiny neurons in our dorsal striatum up here that respond to dopamine. And in the inhibitory pathway, we've lost that inhibition because we have neurons that have died there early in the disease. So if dopamine desensitizes those inhibitory neurons to glutamate, that's just even more inhibition. You're going to get more chorea movement. And so if you can block dopamine, you can block its desensitizing effect and then glutamate that excitatory neurotransmitter can get more out of those few existing inhibitory neurons. So hopefully you follow that. So the goal symptomatically is let's decrease dopamine to get the most out of the neurons we do have and avoid some of that chorea movement. <clears throat> so there's two different types of drugs that work two different ways on decreasing this dopamine. One of them is a drug called tetrabenzamine. And what it does is whenever you have action potential from the midbrain and it goes up here to the putamen and the anterior caudate nucleus, the dorsal striatum, that, that action potential, potential is going to come down and it's going to stimulate release of dopamine where these dopamine, the dopamine in these vesicles merge with the membrane and through exocytosis release dopamine into the synaptic cleft and that binds to a dopamine type 2 receptor. And then that will affect this... Um, medium spiny neuron that's up here. So if dopamine binds to it, that's going to cause this to be less excited because it's not going to respond to glutamate as much. So we want to block that. We want this to be excited. We want more inhibition because we don't have enough. So with tetrabenzamine, uh, basically what it does is it has this little, um, it blocks this transporter. So down here in the axon terminal, Tyrosine is an amino acid that gets converted to L-DOPA and then from L-DOPA it becomes dopamine. And that all happens out here in the cytoplasm and then it has to get into the vesicles and it travels in what's called a VMAT, which called, stands for Vesicular Monoamine Transporter 2. It's a monoamine because it was an amino acid. We took off the carboxylic acid so it just has amino group. So it's basically amino acid minus the acid. And so that's called a monoamine. And so we have this vesicular monoamine transporter two, and it's getting blocked. So we can't get dopamine into the vesicles. If we can't get dopamine into the vesicles, we can't release it through exocytosis, and dopamine is not going to have an effect of desensitizing our, our medium spiny neurons of our inhibitory neurons. So that's what tetrabenzamine does: is it blocks the transport of dopamine into those vesicles. So. Um, 
The other type of drug is called an antipsychotic. <clears throat> and basically it binds to the receptors for dopamine, which there's different types of receptors. And one of them is the D2 type. And that's the ones that's found in these medium spiny neurons in the putamen and anterior caudate nucleus. And <clears throat> so if you take an antipsychotic drug and some examples of this are haloperidol and pinnozide. Uh, these are two drugs that will actually bind to these D2 receptors and they don't stimulate them. They just basically take up space like a competitive inhibitor and prevent the actual dopamine from binding to those. Again, that's haloperidol and pinozide. Those are the drugs that can be used as antipsychotics that are their D2 receptor antagonist. <clears throat> so either way, you're reducing dopamine's effect on these inhibitory neurons so they can be more inhibitory and you don't get as much of that Huntington's chorea. As the disease progresses, it's strange because you go from this hyperkinesia, which is too much movement, to hypokinesia, where you don't move enough. So later in the disease process, um, basically the other set, the excitatory neurons degenerate, and they degenerate even more so than the inhibitory ones did in the beginning. So you have this shift of over inhibition Instead of having too much movement, they actually become immobile and rigid. So if you try to, rigidity means it's, it, you know, this is something you see in Parkinson's disease too, is when you try to move the limb, it's rigid, whether you're trying to extend or flex the limb. And so that's what you see as the disease progresses. You see apathy behaviorally where they just don't care about anything and just seem kind of like they, they're just not really contributing to conversations. They just sort of, you know, don't care about anything. Uh, dementia, so they, you know, their cognitive processes, executive functioning fall, and rigidity. These are what happens towards the end of the disease. So you wouldn't want to take the dopamine antagonist and uh, the de 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 dopamine depletion drugs when you get to this stage. You just want to take those early on. So it's really sad. That's kind of how it progresses. And um, so one... Thing that's kind of hopeful about the future is, you know, with CRISPR, you have gene editing. And a lot of these genetic diseases, uh, you know, I envision 10 or 15 years down the road that they're obsolete. Because if you can go in and change the genes early on, then all of these drugs, I mean, all these pathologies that have genetic components to them can be a thing of the past. So I have some encouragement there as far as uh, where this is going. Thank you.